नमस्कार गुड मॉर्निंग टू ऑल ऑफ यू चार्टर्ड अकाउंटेंट रंजीत कुमार अग्रवाल द प्रेसिडेंट ऑफ आई सी ए आई एडवोकेट संजय झावर जी जस्टिस भंडारी एंड ऑल डिग्नेटरीज ऑन द डायस dignitaries and the elite of uh, jaipur who have come over for this meeting i am really privileged to stand here in the land of warriors most of whom have been great source of inspiration for all indians be it prithviraj chauhan maharana pratap rana rana sanga maharaja sawai jay singh Savai Man Singh, Amar Singh, Rana Hamir Singh have all stood for a great India, sacrificed themselves for it. So I bow my head with great respect to this land of warriors who literally stood like a big fort in the borders of this country. even today in the armed forces you have great number of people from rajasthan who defend our country not so much in the deserts but also in high altitude mountains snow capped peaks and even in the borders with myanmar the tropical jungles so i pay my respects also to the armed forces which is represented adequately by people from rajasthan Durgashtami has been referred to in the welcome address. It's Vasant Navratri period. We worship Shakti, all right, but on the Navmi day it is going to be all Ayodhya. After several decades, several centuries, Sri Ram has found a Bhavya Mandir where he should have been. where he should have resided and as you say in Rajasthan virajman in that holy uh, beautiful bhavya mandir for ever for always but unfortunately he hadn't had a place to be except for a tent and that literally tugged at the heart of every indian and today when he is got his due place we all will celebrate this first ram navmi with our lord being in the right place and with the pran pratishtha of shri ram all of us can hope and i'm sure we'll realize our dreams the golden era of india will start it starts with an amrit kal the viksit bharat of 2047 hopefully will be achieved with sabka prayas and in that the intellectuals the knowledge torch bearers of india who largely reside in rajasthan will have a big role to play and i'm happy to start my campaign in rajasthan addressing the intellectuals it is this optimism which prime minister modi has brought in into a country which had given up all its hopes in 2013-14 irrespective of party affiliation no one could hide the fact that you were not sure where we were going fragile five we were capital was getting out of the country not just those foreign direct investments which had come but even our india's own businesses big businesses were shifting their balance sheet to outside of india than remain in india that was 1314 and your party loyalties couldn't have hidden this fact from you so you didn't have to be in the opposition as bjp was at that time to realize that the country has come to nowhere and that was 2013 14 but from there 
In fact, one of the things which I said in the parliament, when I released the white paper on the Indian economy, 10 long years after, duly when people said you should have released it in 2013-14, why are you releasing it now? I, in all my modesty, appreciate the Honorable Prime Minister for having not released it in 2014. It's such a story that today we look back with a sense of confidence, saying it's all right, we were, you know, fragile five. These many number of scams had happened. Scams by themselves are wrong, but each one of the scams had created a collateral damage to the economy. And shortage of coal would have resulted in, you know, 72 hours of blackout in the western part of India at that time. Or shortage of coal would have left many of the thermal producing uh, companies, uh, thermal producing public sector undertakings also without power and so on. But the fact is, today we are looking back with confidence because in the 10 years, the economy had been restored with tremendous effort, transparent effort, with not a whisper of corruption and a complete dedication shown by the Honorable Prime Minister. So if uh, we are at a stage where even a white paper which would have sounded How can I put it? A white paper, if released in 2014, would have sounded only a sense of hopelessness in this country. It would have established the fear that something has gone wrong, we don't know how deep the problem is, and can we ever come out of this? That would have been the summoned substance of people reading a white paper in 2014 would have been. So reading it in 14 would have left India even further into a confusion, into hopelessness, and a disbelief that we can ever revive. So the levels of scandal, the extent of scandal, the scope and size of the scandal, all of which gave a message to the Indians that even as you were reading it in the media, it made you think, what has been so badly handled? Can it ever be restored? So releasing it 10 years afterwards, it actually tells you what it was then and what kind of effort it took for us to come back to being the fifth largest economy. Even as we say fifth largest economy, we are sure that within a few years, maybe just one and a half, two years, we'll reach the third largest economy stage. So I would think it was totally responsible of Prime Minister Modi, a very responsible, caring decision of Prime Minister Modi that he didn't release that white paper there then, but released it now to say why today India is where it is, despite that negativity. Today there is no negativity, there is hope, there is positivity, there is this almost certainty in everybody's mind that is a responsible leader's decision-making power that he did not want to expose his opponent for short-term gains, but he took a call that he will restore the economy and then yet put the facts on the table of the House. That is why the white paper came much later than when it was expected by a large number of people. Now today, the quarter, the third quarter of 23-24 saw an unprecedented growth of 8.4%. Unprecedented in the world history. And why am I saying world history? I'm not comparing years, decades before, centuries before. But I'm still using the word history. Because in today's volatility, not one war, two wars, and yesterday probably a third war, if I may call that, I don't wish the war, I want peace to prevail, but I'm saying a third incident of something going wrong. Disruption in high seas. Pirates in the Red Sea. Disruption in global high seas means your trade and traffic of goods, movement of goods, are all unpredictably affected. 
West Asia is the source of maximum crude coming to India. Of course, we have strategically, during the COVID times and immediately after that, also started buying from Russia because it was coming at a discount. It was in our national interest to do that. We started obtaining it. So if 8.4 growth in a quarter in the year 23-24 can happen, it just shows how much Indians are waiting to grow and move faster to achieve greater goals. And if the fourth quarter is lucky and we get a good number, I'm sure we'll average out at eight for the overall 23-24 growth. And I would think, if not at eight, it is possible to sustain a good high growth in India because the entire ground has been created for every entrepreneur to feel that this is the best time for him or her to come out and undertake responsibilities. So I do not want to reel out with the passenger vehicle sales, tractor sales to prove that the economy is moving all right. It will not be moving all right if only the economy is not rightly positioned. But that one indicator which comes out every month is today used like a barometer. You're just reading the economy using that every month. And that was not a luxury which was available earlier. Now it is available post GST's introduction by this government. And after the introduction, even if the first few years they had a lot more of teething problem, today it is stabilized. Of course, there's need for us to further rationalize, further simplify the GST. But even today, it is giving us that one indicator with businesses, chartered accountants, economy observers, all will be waiting to see what is going to happen GST collection. Are you not waiting for it every month? Yes. Every month on the first, we look forward to knowing what is the number. And once you know that the number is really on the uptick, you know the economy is doing well. Then everybody sits up saying, chalo, aur aage. So today the economy's measurements don't have to wait for the data to come from which sector, what, you know overall the GST returns tell you that every small, medium and big business is doing all right if the collection is all right. The collection is not just all right, it is doing very well. And now after the election, the way in which the BJP Sankalpatra is already speaking about, further reforms will be taken up. One such a thing, of course, the GST Council will have to take a call is to look at rationalizing the rates, making it far more simpler, looking at bringing rates reasonably for all goods. Of course, India is a country with wide disparity in income. We can't afford to have people paying the same rate for extreme luxury goods as much as daily essentials. So some Common sense logic will have to prevail and people will have to sit in the council and think about it and I'm sure those activities will happen. But there are opportunity for industry, there are opportunity for MSMEs largely because the way in which we envisage the economy, Indian economy, is even if there is one mother unit, there should be around it a lot of small and other supplementary, uh, what used to be called as ancillary units. We need that ecosystem for every major production. If, if 6G is going to be rolled out, 5G is successfully rolled out, we need the ecosystem to produce and support these kind of major producing or manufacturing units in India. If 600 or more than that, nearly a thousand aircrafts are going to be coming into India to join into the civil aviation fleet, the maintenance, the repair, repair and operations of these aircrafts will also need manpower, will also need technical manpower. And their accounting processes will also need your support. So there is ever so many opportunity for businesses to grow. Chartered accountants themselves have so much to update and I'm glad that uh, 
Ranjit Kumar Agarwal, the Chartered Accountant President, President of ICAI, is a very reform-minded person. He's brought in a lot more steps to enable more and more students to qualify. I would only want to underline the fact that we have undertaken signing of MOUs with a lot of countries. With that, mutual recognition of qualifications are completely possible. There can be exchange of professionals between the countries with whom we are signing these MOUs. I, I'm very convinced that that is going to benefit chartered accountants in a very big way. You're already forming groups to be able to globally work as outsourced centers. There was somebody who received the award for and a recognition for running the largest such an outsourcing place. You've set the trend. We are signing it with other countries. Good luck to such people who have taken these initiatives. And very glad to see Rajasthan standing out in this. Um, there were several things that I wanted to talk about. Uh, the profession itself, where you're doing a lot of uh, internal introspection on how best the practices can be, how you can make your accounting standards meet up with global standards, and how you can ready all members of the ICAI to be savvy to handle these technology-driven accounting times of our era. I even tell the um, entire board, the direct taxation board and the CBIC, that the technology that they use is not for technology per se. The technology that they use is an instrument for making life easier. So it should have the right content of what an SSC is looking for. It can't just be a technically I've done the job, but the SSC knows that it's not meeting his requirements. The chartered accountant knows that it is not up to the mark. So I always tell the boards that if they do have their own expertise or if they're commissioning an agency to do the work of getting the technology for them, it should be suffused with people from the profession from the chartered accountants, from the cost accountants, to come and assess if it is going to adapt to the requirements so that compliance becomes not complicated but simple. So more and more chartered accountants and their engagement with the boards, I would think, will make systems easier. It will make life easier for taxpayers. It will make it a lot more savvy for the profession to say today, I'm giving my knowledge component, but my, the monotony of my job is taken away because of technology coming in. So in summary, that is exactly what I want to say to you. And this is what the Prime Minister is hoping, that India will be knowledge driven. Areas like tourism, particularly standing in Rajasthan, which stands out for tourism, will be one of those big job giving areas. A lot of emphasis has been given in the manifesto for youth, for tourism, for technology-driven uh, growth, for artificial intelligence and Internet of Things so that we are able to bring greater transparency into the processes and decision-making. So with these words, knowing that there is an interaction, I will not take too much time for a monologue. I leave it for you all to uh, have the interaction conducted so I can respond to some of your questions. Thank you very much. First of all, I'm thankful for covering a macro view of the roadmap to developed nation, uh, making India a developed nation, and uh, how the government and you personally are working for that. I'll straightway come to some of the issues which have been raised and we have received from the audience. The first uh, issue, uh, Honorable Ma'am, is regarding this uh, new 43B Clause H. And uh, you know because you have been moving around the country and this is the problem which is there throughout the country. The feeling is that uh, perhaps the intent was to give the benefit to the micro and small. But the consequence is otherwise as they are losing business. And P 
people or the large industries are uh, not liking buying from them because of this additional burden is one aspect. And second, which was raised during panel discussion was that why government is using income tax law to define how people should do businesses. For conduct of business, you have several other things. In income tax law, through insertion of this provision, he is to work out his working capital that now, now I can do this business only when I have this much of working capital that I can pay everyone in 45 days. No matter my export proceeds, RBI allows me six months, but I have to pay in 45 days. So many businesses, either they'll be out or they are seeing that perhaps uh, government wanted to help them it is becoming counterproductive. So what is, whether there is any thought of addressing this and how the government is thinking about this issue. I really think I have to answer the question which is going to break my chair to I hope you watch what I'm saying. I'm accused of speaking bluntly. So pardon me if I sound blunt. Paying MSME within 45 days. I didn't bring it to the finance. It wasn't brought to the income tax. See, sometimes I feel, and now I feel that, I'm talking to people who know it, but who don't want to admit it. You all know it, but for some reason you don't want to admit it. The Embassy Act for eight years has said pay within 45 days. You all look the other way because nobody was paying within 45 days. It's a law. And the MSME groups were constantly pounding the government saying, nobody is obeying that, will you not help us? And during the year 22 23, a senior minister in the cabinet, Shinitin Mankuriji, had very clearly voiced his concern saying something like, I don't know the exact number he said, but very big. Seven lakh crores is spending for the MSMEs. God knows, who's not paying? What's happening? I immediately called my department to, you know, together and I said, please, let's go thread the wire into this. Where are the MSMEs? Who's sitting over payments for MSME? I invited each one of the public sector undertaking and said, put your account before me. Tell me how many MSMEs you've not paid. So 22, 23, week on week I was doing only this and exerted as much as I could to say clear your dues within 45 days and after that, that cycle should continue. Newer bills, newer 45 days and so on. But even then I couldn't total 7 lakh crores. Maybe it was with the state governments or state held public sector undertakings. Over. Then I literally went back to those people who said 45 days, no payment, you're not doing anything. I said, but yeah, I've done this review. As much as possible, we are now clearing it. And then if states are holding it back or private sector companies are holding it back, I wouldn't know anything about it. And I can't put pressure on them, except the fact that it is a law, they are not obeying. The, and rightly, people who are waiting for money to come in time, tendency would be, Are, but sarkar kuch nahi kar pa rahe. So if we ask them, give us solutions, give us suggestion how to go about it. MSMEs themselves suggested to us that they don't pay within 45 days. They don't even pay within that financial year. They pay probably the next financial year or sometimes even afterwards. But they take fiscal benefit because they show it as expenditure. 
So they themselves, the MSME themselves gave that thought to us. Saying yo MSME kanun mein jo 45 days hai, usse fayda nahi hai. Bracingly, it's being violated. मगर ये ये जब गलती हो रही है फिनेंशियल ईयर के अंदर भी पेमेंट जब नहीं हो रही आप क्या करने वाले हैं सो वी हैव नॉट डिनाइड एनीथिंग टू यू टू योर क्लाइंट्स वी हैव सेड द ईयर यू पे यू क्लेम दैट एस एक्सपेंडिचर द बेनिफिट इज स्टिल अक्रूविंग टू यू बट वी अक्रू इट विल दैट ईयर व्हेन यू पे उतना ही तो किया क्या बवाल मचा दिया भाई <laughs> और ठीक है वोट ऑन अकाउंट दिस टाइम डिड आई ब्रिंग दिस ड्यूरिंग द वोट ऑन अकाउंट नो बजट 23 24 फर्स्ट फेब्रुवरी 2023 वन ईयर होल पासिस क्वाइटली Suddenly, some rightly clients' interest is important. Suddenly, some chartered accountant said, "Hey, what happened, boy? Sir, this year, to up your account me." So the MSME started. The company started, not so much the MSMEs. They said, "Okay, boy, inse kabi nahi lena abse." So all MSMEs were told, "Look, we will not buy from you." So MSME ke liye rona. सिर्फ एमएसएमई और सरकार दूसरे एमएसएमई एमएसएमई से जो खरीद रहे वो भी रोता नहीं है एमएसएमई के लिए देर इज अ मॉरल हसार्ड नाउ दे आर सेइंग वी वोट टेक फ्रॉम एमएसएमई विल टेक इट फ्रॉम पीपल हु हैव डीप पॉकेट्स बिग इंडस्ट्रीज आपसे क्या खरीदना है दैट आर्ग्यूमेंट नाउ इज पुट बिफोर मी सेंग अरे हमसे नए खरीद रहे हैं भाई अरे यू गे मे द सोल्यूशन सो <laughs> so, आपसे कौन नहीं खरीद रहा दूसरा एमएसएमई और बड़ा कंपनी सो अमंग बायर एंड सेलर कुछ भी गड़बड़ हो प्रॉब्लम इज गवर्नमेंट हाउ डू आई हैंडल दिस हाउ डू आई हैंडल दिस ओके यू केम हम नहीं ये ठीक प्रिंसिपल है जी देख लो जी कितना अच्छा बोलते हैं ना लोग इट्स ओनली मी हु वेरी प्लांट एवरीबडी एल्स कम्स एंड सेस नहीं अच्छा तो क्या है नो no डाउट अच्छा क्या है जी हम भी सिंपथेटिक हैं मगर इस साल ना करो <laughs> और इस साल ना करो का मतलब क्या है आप कम से कम वोट ऑन अकाउंट से पहले आते क्योंकि दिस इज कानून एन अमेंडेड आई कुड हैव गॉन इन एंड सेड ओके दिस विल बी इंप्लीमेंटेड फ्रॉम नेक्स्ट ईयर और समथिंग ड्यूरिंग द बजट हो गया वोट ऑन अकाउंट के अगले दिन आए नहीं आए आफ्टर सम टाइम एंड वॉट इज दैट आफ्टर सम टाइम दिस इज द इलेक्शन ईयर लोकसभा वॉज प्रोरोग मतलब हो गया अभी लोकसभा का रेफरेंस है तो नया लोकसभा बैठने के बाद ही मैं देर वॉज वन ग्रुप विच मेट मी एंड ऑर्डिनेंस ले आओ जी क्यों ये तो आपके हाथ में है हाँ जी अगर लोकसभा ही नहीं है ऑर्डिनेंस ने कैसे ले आओ सो यू सेड वन वर्ड इंटेंट सरकार का मदद करने के लिए है मगर देखो कानून में डालने के लिए सुझाव आया डाल दिया अगर वो रूल्स में होता आई कुड मेंटेड इट नो यू वांट टू बी श्योर दैट यू आर डिक्टेटिंग टू द गवर्नमेंट हम भी मानते हैं रूल में डाल दिया तो आई वुड हैव करेक्टेड बट कानून में डाल दिया आई नीड द हाउस टू बी देर सो दैट्स द स्टोरी थैंक यू मैम This was question from income tax. My next question comes from GST, and uh, we know, we all know, government knows that fake bills, fake credits, and the people who supply them, they should be punished. Nobody should be spared. But 
Because of this 16 to C provision, what's happening is you are casting the burden of all kind of bona fide purchases also on the buyer as to whether your supplier makes the payment or not. If he doesn't make the payment, then we'll not give the credit. Now what's happening because of this, I'll say two problems because of this. Uh, people are looking at GST portal that this supplier is genuine, he has GST number, is, they are buying from him, let's say in a purchase they have 50 lakh of GST, they are paying that 50 lakh to him. That person is not depositing in the government, he may be located in one India, one tax, maybe anywhere, maybe in Tamil Nadu, Rajasthan is the buyer, Tamil Nadu is the supplier, he is not paying. This fellow doesn't have access to that person. And now government says because you paid 50 lakh GST to him, but he is not deposited to government, so you again pay 50 lakh to us with interest. So, uh, this first aspect and second aspect is, there is an IBC law, and you very well know, their government itself comes forward and says that if somebody becomes insolvent, we'll take the hit first. And then government says that at 50 lakh, which that your supplier was supposed to pay to us, we'll sacrifice, we'll not take from him. They settled in IBC, NCLT says, uh, scheme of resolution finalized, tax department has to compromise, this tax department accept this. But 16 to see this buyer says, because the government compromised, the government has not compromised, government says, now you have paid 50 to him, now 50 to us, because in their case we have compromised. So is this intended? or unintended consequence of uh, something which the government wanted because here the buyer has no say in this the resolution in the hands of vendor government does as per his own scheme and CLT finalized bank would get this they will do sacrifice of 10 pesa GST department would do this and sometimes another peculiar problem if there is a 2 crore rupees of payment and NCLT passes the scheme that will pay 1 crore out of this no, nobody knows this one crore is which one crore? My, the amount which I paid is 50 lakhs or somebody else paid, so nobody gets the credit. Is this intended, unintended? Uh, uh, that's the question. Now, there are two parts to this question. Huh? The first part relates to you buy something, the example that you took is your supplier is somewhere in Tamil Nadu, you are here. The supplier has not paid his part of the tax, so the, the board comes to you. See, the larger issue when this decision was taken in the council was, if you as a buyer is not able to track your seller, can the government do it? And for how many people can the government do it? So the GST council discussed all this and only then took this rasta. So let that remain there. But the other side about how settlements are happening, how IBC is, uh, uh, you know, resolution professionals are settling things, that's a different side of the story, but has an impact on this. I agree. So we need to, we have to take a picture on this. It can't just always be that you have no contact or no hold over your supplier. But at the same time, can you for each time that you buy a stuff be held responsible? There are legitimate questions here. I don't uh, ignore them. I'm not saying no, I don't care about them. We'll have to have a more comprehensive discussion in the GST Council, but it's also not fair to say I buy one from today, another one I buy from somebody else. So my, it's not my responsibility. That much if you and your seller relationship is not even clear, the government is just not going to be able to function as much as you. Can you go on changing your supplier? And will you? And do you? So there are a lot of questions, but the concern is well recognized. It's taken cognizance of the next GST council will get into the details. Thank you. Uh, a very small issue on GST, the 16.4 uh, in which there is a cutoff date and 
uh, for first year the cutoff date was extended to 30th November realizing the difficulties in the portal and everything and now the amendment has taken place that forever 30th uh, November would be the date only in between two years have left first year it, from October it became November from uh, 22 again it became November forever but this 1819 1920 that remains October and some people have that nine days delay and ten days delay because of the same difficulty that reconciliation is taking place at the vendors and or there is some difficulty in filing and GSTR 2 has not been notified so uh, I'm sure the council will take a good call on it they're con conscious of it thank you uh, my next question is uh, not from GST, but from uh, uh, Rajasthan's perspective. Last. Uh, Rajasthan's, and Rajasthan has uh, great potential because it is the largest, has the largest land mass intellectual. I, I have already mentioned several things. Uh, and the panel discussed that if the government focuses on a clustered development model for Rajasthan because Rajasthan is good at several things then they pointed out seven or eight things largest oil producing state edible oil producing state similarly large, largest this uh, millet producing state and there are several education and healthcare and uh, renewable energy because 325 days we have a sun which can produce solar power and uh, mining and service sector so they pointed out this so could there be uh, a plan because every time uh, sometimes the government issue or political issues comes and now you have double engine Sarkar. So are there any special plans for Rajasthan because wherever the potential is there perhaps Rajasthan can help in making India a developed nation by if the potential is properly utilized. There's no doubt. And I will not hesitate to say Rajasthan's potential is underutilized. And that is not just in solar, certainly in rare earths, certainly in edible oil, certainly in millets, and most certainly in tourism also. So it is not a question of having a special package for a state or not for another state. For each one of this, Government has already come up with a whole lot of schemes, whole lot of, you know, bringing together. And uh, I'll definitely underline the point that states should look for the welfare of its own people and work together with the center. There are quite a few states who do that despite having a government run by a different political party. Unfortunately, and I say this with responsibility, unfortunately, the last five years in Rajasthan did not put its people's interest on the top. I will take one very important example. When the government, which is now no longer the in power, was here, the enthusiasm with which they went ahead without even comprehending the complication in the matter, oh, we'll restore the old pension scheme. And they promised, they started executing it when their own party's leaders were saying, hey, be careful, don't do this. Himachal Pradesh went ahead announcing copying from Rajasthan and won an election. Rajasthan said we have implemented it. The contribution made under the new pension scheme which has gone to the central pool, you give that money back to us. They went to that extent. Did it help Rajasthan? I'm not even talking about other things. Did it help Rajasthan? The same party which executed it here in haste today does not want to put it in its manifesto when it is contesting the Lok Sabha for the entire country. How morally was it right? Was it in the interest of the people of Rajasthan? And today when your party is being questioned saying why are you not putting it in your manifesto, you implemented it in Rajasthan, 
you won an election showing that in Himachal? They say, no, it will be premature for us because the central government under the finance secretary has come up with a committee to look at OPS and NPS. So this kind of haste with which, for political reasons, a state's larger interest is sacrificed, Rajasthan suffered because of that. There are other two, three examples that I can take, only for political reasons. Don't your people matter? People of Rajasthan don't matter. They've elected you to be in power. So whether it is tourism, whether it is energy sector renewable, whether it is edible oil, whether it is even the um, crude or rare earths or tourism, nothing can stop Rajasthan from growing. Nothing can stop the young of Rajasthan who are all coming through wonderful education. Look at the rich back um, or uh, uh, rich, uh, what can I say, wealth of chartered accountants who are here. You have every potential to grow and grow rapidly, but you need a government which understands the interest of the state and takes it up with the center and does things. Modi, Prime Minister, is somebody who wants every state to grow. If even one state drags it down, the growth, all India is going to suffer. And Rajasthan doesn't have to suffer given the potential that it has. Thank you, ma'am. And uh, uh, I've, uh, organizers have indicated that you have another program to attend. Therefore, I'm skipping all other questions. Uh, uh, thank you uh, very much. And now, uh, over to MOCs.